game for those who were here last week and may recall a game that we started with our new series, Be Different. We play a little game called Dollar or Different. It's where I give you the opportunity to decide the difference between what's in the box. Our box has grown considerably. Or, because the box was taken last week, like I promised, there's two dollars this time. Okay? So it's the box of two dollars, but I gotta, I gotta name some differences and get you down to one person. I guarantee Aaron Mask will not win this week. So, please feel free to stand. Remember, I have you stand and then I name a difference. I name a difference, and if that difference describes you, then you sit down. Now again, as you know, you will be given the opportunity at one point in the game. If it gets too intense, I give you the easy out. Okay, you can just, you can just sit down. So everybody can stand up, and I'll start naming differences. And if I name your difference, you need to sit down. Okay? Remember, this is the one that made everybody mad last week. So this week, if you are male, sit down. Okay, see, now the ladies are all excited. Sit down. Everybody close their eyes. Everybody close their eyes. Yeah, go ahead and sit down. If you've eaten chocolate in the last 24 hours, sit down. I knew that would wipe out almost all of Really? In the last 24 hours, you've consumed no chocolate. That's pretty impressive. If you are the youngest sibling, Sit down. <laughs> if you're the oldest sibling in your family, sit down. Oh no. <laughs> Allison Shepard. Way up in the back. Alright, alright. So. I want the box. You will get what's in the box. Okay. But because we all know delayed gratification is always, always better, what is in the box, because you have chosen it, will be unveiled during the sermon. Okay. okay? And I know you went 24 hours without chocolate, so you can go 17 minutes without seeing the box. All right, we'll give it up for Allison. She made a good show. She wanted to pick the box because it's my visual aid for the sermon. So thank you, Alex, and I've been a real picker. Well, I want to welcome you back to message number two in our Be Different series, where we are studying together the New Testament letters of First, Second, and Third John. Okay, believed to be written by none other than the beloved disciple John, the author of the Gospel of John. A wonderful, wonderful book that we moved through in the series before this one, but now we are in the letter of John. It is also believed that this disciple John lived longer than any of the other disciples. He saw the church of Jesus grow through generations of families passing the faith down. And as the faith was passed, some were forgetting the profound and pronounced differences that there are in Christianity. Oh, brothers and sisters, that John's word would echo in our ears today. I believe the Christian church in America has been submerged in a pagan culture that wants to muddy the difference between believers and deceivers. A faith that doesn't just talk the talk, but actually walks the walk. And that's our point. To 
clearly define the different walk we as Christians must walk if we say we are following Jesus. Now, I want to invite you to turn in your Bible. So many of you are fast on the draw. You already turned there to 1 John, the book of 1 John. We're in chapter 2. It's page 1337 in your student Bible. They're, they are posted at the ends of your pews. They're there for you to use. They are new Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, you can read and understand. We invite you to take that home and uh, call it your own. I'm in 1 John, and I'm going to chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Did you get there yet? You did. I just want you to know, Joanne Kaufman is still having a lot of pain. Uh, so she's not here to holler back at me. Yeah, we're here. Keep going. So, uh, so some of you will have to pick up the torch for Joe. So we're in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Are you there? Yes. Oh, yeah. That was a little better. Good All right. Verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. A different walk moves with atoning forgiveness. Atoning forgiveness. Now last week, we talked about the how of forgiveness. Now, when we sin, how do we get forgiven? And I tossed you three C's. I tossed you three C's that we moved through with the text. How do we get forgiven? Does anybody even remember one C from last week? Oh, it's okay. I won't review them. First C is you claim it. You claim the sin. You say, yes, I sinned. Someone once said, there's an awful lot of maturity that happens between the milk fell on the floor and I dropped the milk on the floor. Okay? When we see, okay, I did it, it was sin. We claim it. We claim responsibility for the sin in our life. But then we also confess it. How many, how many parents here have ever heard a kid claim it? Yeah, I did it. So what? That's not a confession. It's a good claim. They claimed it. But the confession says, I did it and it was wrong. I did it and it hurt you. And I, I'm sorry. We confess the sin to God first, but then also to those that our sin hurt. That's confessing. It also steals the secret power of sin when we confess it to a brother or a sister. And then we're cleansed by it. We allow Jesus' blood. That cleansing blood that we saw in chapter 1, verse 7 that says that purifies us from all sin. Now today, we will encounter the why of Jesus' forgiveness in these verses. Why does his forgiveness work? But it comes with loaded terms. Verse 2. If you look at chapter 2, verse 2, he, it says, he is the what? He is the the atoning sacrifice. Because at the end of verse 1, he is the righteous one. What does atonement mean? Atonement is, is, a, is a Bible word, is a religious ease word that means to make amends or to make a payment. There's a sin and there needs to be a payment for that sin. Let me give you just a crash course summary of all religions on earth from the beginning of time until now. Okay, you ready for it? Two phrases, crash course on all religions of the earth of all time up until now. Two phrases. God is holy. We are not. This is the essence of religion. Religion tries to come in between those two phrases and make some sense out of the world. 
to make some sense out of how we relate to God. God is holy. We are not. So what do we do? Every religion has struggled with this theological reality. What do we do with sin? Only biblical Christianity says, okay, here's the answer. Here's the answer to what we need to do with our sin. Jesus himself will come down and walk in our steps, but never sin. Then give his life to pay the debt of sin as a perfect sacrifice. A gift we do not deserve. To pay a penalty we could never pay. Jesus is our defender when we receive him as our servant. He hears our confession and says, says to the Father, Yes, my blood covers that one too. Yes, my blood covers that one too. When we confess our sin at the spiritual level, at the supernatural level, Jesus is defending us, saying, well, I, I died for her. I died for her. My blood covers that sin. I was helping uh, with, a, with a speaker one time. A special speaker was coming into town, and uh, I had to get supplies for him. And he said, for the visual aid that I'm going to do, I need you to go get me some red paint. And so I said, okay, I'll go get red paint. So I went to the hardware store, and there was the spray cans, red paint. So I went and got the red paint, spray can, and I brought it back. And he was like, no, dude, not spray, spray paint. I need to paint poor. I need to paint what I want. Why don't you tell me you want to paint poor? So I went and I took it back. And then I came back with a, with a can of paint. And his illustration was he, he had a whiteboard. Or a big piece of white uh, cardboard with a black marker. And he wrote sins. He wrote different sins on it. Okay? Black on the white. <coughs> And then he talked about the reality that Jesus' blood covers those sins. And he took that bucket of red paint. And he, and he went over to that, to that white board and he said, they're, they're lust? Yeah, Jesus' blood covers that. And, and the red paint ran out on the cover. Greed? Yeah, Jesus' blood covers that. And he went all through all these sins. And I was like, oh, I get it now. Because it covers it. It was a powerful visual. Jesus' blood isn't just a little spray can. It just puts a little mist over it. It covers it completely. Thus, we are forgiven. Do you believe that you are forgiven? Not just because you confess, not just because you were sorry, but because your sin was actually paid for. Your debt was paid for by Jesus. Not just your sin and my sin, but that everyone's sin was paid for on the cross. That's incredible when you think about it. Now, does that make you walk differently with people around you? When you think about the, the reality that, that our sins have not been paid for by what we did, not the good that we do, not the confession that we make, but Jesus paid for us. It should make us walk with humility. It should make us walk with graciousness and generosity to give other people that same grace. But now, the walk and talk rubber hits the road in verses 3 and 4. Verses 3 and 4. We know that we have come to know Him if we obey His commands. The man who says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands is a liar. And the truth is not in Him. A different walk moves with true obedience. A different walk moves with true obedience. You see those first two verses, if we're not careful, they'll kick open the crazy sin door. What is the crazy sin door? Well, look, if Jesus' blood covers all of it, then who cares how I live? I don't have to get forgiven. I don't have to get forgiven. 
forgiveness. It's no big deal how I live. I don't necessarily need to obey anybody because I got the get out of hell free card. Well, that's not the way we need to live. I want to obey because I love Jesus. Not just because I know that I'll be forgiven for whatever I do. Play that out in your other relationships. Play, play out that mentality with your other relationships. You know, my kids will always love me. It don't matter if I abuse and neglect them. They'll always love me, won't they? Play it out with your spouse. My spouse will always love me. Even if I don't spend time with them, or if, even if I'm not intimate with them, they'll always love me because they're my spouse. My parents will always love me. Even if I'm disrespectful or ungrateful to them, they'll always love me. Isn't there a disconnect there? Isn't there a lack of walking together there? A lack of integrity? Now, I know, friends, obedience is almost a dirty word in our culture unless you're talking about training your dog. Obedience. But may I suggest that obedience is another word for love. You can say, I love you as long and as loud as you want. But if the point of obedience comes, and you don't give obedience, do you love them? When your kid comes and says for the 50th time that we dead, can we just play just for five minutes? When your spouse says, Please do this for me. When your parents say, I need your help with this, and we bristle, we bristle back against obeying. And I know, I know I'm not, I'm a, scripture is commands, and well, are you saying, Todd, that those are commands from the Lord? I'm just saying, draw the parallel. Draw the parallel. How do we obey? Why do we obey? Is that out of a sense of guilt, fear of punishment? Or is it out of a sense of love? Is the relationship real? Are we walking together? Well, now that, let's flip this over to the God perspective. If God tells us, do this, forgive, bless, love. If God says, don't do this. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't lust. And we just ignore him. And we walk in disobedience. We're living a lie. The text says we're living a lie because we're not walking the talk. I need to ask you, what are ways that you are walking in obedience? What are ways that you're walking around? Congratulations. You're here. Worship is an act of obedience to God. You showing up on Sunday morning is an act of obedience that God loves. He loves to see you. He loves to hear you sing, watch you pray. Are you serving? So many of you serve in so many wonderful ways. And it's beautiful. It's an act of obedience. But there's still more ways to serve. The wing still needs volunteers to clean. It's interesting, Pat mentioned that Brentfield still needs folks to go visit on Sunday mornings. There's a roster that people can go over and just read a scripture verse, sing a song, maybe. And you can go over there and sing. And half the folks over there can't hear you. I have people say, I can't sing. It's okay. You won't even bother them. But you're showing up. You're smiling. You're there. You're saying, I care. There, there are places we can go and we can serve as an act of obedience to God. But 
that has a flip side. Is there still areas of disobedience in your life? What is it? What is it that God is asking you not to do? Or God is asking you to stop doing? Uh, I had a friend tell me they were confronted this last week by, by a person and uh, they, had, they had popped out a cigarette and this new acquaintance of theirs said, no, I thought you were a Christian. Here you are smoking a cigarette. And this other person turned to them and said, well, I just want you to know, I used to, pack, I used to smoke three packs a day. And now I'm down to a half. God is working in my life. He's just not quite done yet. Is he done with you? Well, where are you today in regards to, to obedience and disobedience? Can you, can you take just a couple steps towards obedience? Can you take a couple steps away from disobedience? It would be a beautiful thing to walk in true obedience. But then we have the conclusion, the confirmation, verses 5 and 6. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in, in him. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. A different walk moves with complete love. A different walk moves with complete love. Walking into vacation Bible school training the other night, uh, we brought the whole family. She watched my gang walk in. As, as I walked up to the door, she said in a very happy ass way, You know that boy here? Yes, he walks just like you. <laughs> How's that? I mean, I was kind of wondering how I walked. But it's just like you. Well, there's a couple reasons for that. He, he's my boy. So he walks like me. He was born of me. So there are similarities that will be obvious. So it should be with those who are born again of Jesus. Look at verse 6. It's so piercing. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Who are you walking like today? Who does your walk reflect? Your walk, that is what you do. What about your talk? Those things that you say or you think, do they reflect God's complete love when we walk in obedience to His Word? You see, Allison chose what's in the box. And the illustration is, is simply this. Your life should be like a mirror Okay? Your life should be like a mirror. It should reflect. But it's not like a physical mirror. It's not like this mirror that's covered with dust. Wow. They put it in the spotlights. Things in your house can be a lot dirtier than you realize. You borrowed it, right? No. <laughs> um, you look into this mirror, you expect to see yourself. And that's appropriate. It's a, it's a physical mirror. That's what we intend. But our soul is also a mirror. And if we have Jesus inside of us, when people look at us, they should not see our reflection, rather, they should, they should see the reflection of Jesus in how we walk and in how we talk. What do people see in the mirror of your life? What is reflected when people look into your life, into your soul, watch you walking around, watch you talking? Who is reflected? Do 
you walk differently because of Jesus? Does His atoning forgiveness make a difference in the way you walk away from sin? Does His atoning forgiveness, the reality that He paid your debt, does that make you walk away from sin? Does true obedience make you walk towards serving and helping people? Do you possess His complete love that makes you walk like Jesus? Embracing the forgiveness and obedience Jesus offers us so freely. Maybe it's time to start a new walk today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you didn't just stay up in heaven and talk down to us, but you, you actually came down and you walked in our shoes. You faced every trial and temptation that we do. And yet you never sinned. What an incredible life. And then you gave it to us. You gave it to us on the cross so that we can be forgiven. The righteous one hands us your righteousness. Lord, we're not worthy of it. But you did it anyway. Lord, there are people here today that are, are walking in a way that doesn't reflect you. Lord, I pray that the, the Spirit would be searching us out and convicting us. Lord, there are those here today who are walking with you. And they are being obedient. Lord, would you fill them up even more so with 